you have your Bibles with you this evening, would you open them to the book of Hebrews? To chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews. If you're able, stand with me as we read from God's Word. We'll begin reading at chapter 1. At verse 1. <laughs> God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his per person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Under the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. We just talked about that the other day. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hath laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Bow your heads for a moment. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word and leave your Bibles open. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Pray that you might speak to us through it this evening, and for that we'll thank you. Amen. You may be seated. We find our Lord Jesus Christ being compared here to the angels of heaven in our scripture reading. There's a strong indication from what we read here that some in this 
congregation to which this letter is addressed may have tried somehow to assign Jesus a place in the angelic order. Jesus wasn't an angel. Nope. Because of this, the writer is doing his best to try to prove to them how superior Jesus is to the angels of heaven. As he describes Jesus, he describes him in verse 4 as being so much better than the angels with a more excellent name than they. Which of the angels, he says, could say what verse 5 says, that he is the Son of God the Father? Well, of course, none of them could do that. God only has one Son. Or which, as verse 6 says, could say that God the Father had instructed the angels to worship him. Or as verse 13 says, which angel has ever been invited by God to sit on my right hand? And again, no. none of them could because it's reserved for Jesus. The purpose of angels is found there in verse 14. They are described as ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. I don't know about you, but it should be a tremendous comfort to us as Christians to not only know that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, we have Jesus <coughs> at the right hand of God the Father, working as our advocate, but we also have the personal aid of angels available to us, if we should happen to need them. And my Christian friend, you may be thrilled someday when you get to heaven, to look back on your life and see where angels were present to not only help you, but perhaps protect you Amen. in some way. Mm -hmm. Thank God for the ministry of angels. Amen. We may truly be surprised someday what we hear. Now, angels are widely accepted today and still popular with many, including many Muslims. Angels are a very popular thing for Muslims and others. But beware, as with everything else, make sure you're scriptural when it comes to angels. Don't accept everything you hear about angels. Because a large amount of the stuff that you hear about angels, especially on TV, proves to be totally unscriptural. Mm -hmm. There are no female angels, first of all, just for starters. They're all male. And so often on television they're portrayed as female. But a lot of other strange things angels are portrayed at. So it's fine to believe in angels. We certainly should believe in them. But make sure you stick to what the Bible says about them. Or you might find they're false angels. But the whole point of this is not to focus on angels. But to say to us, that Jesus is much more than any angel. He is the precious Son of God. He created the angels. The angels worship Him. The angels do His bidding. The angels heed His instruction. So when you consider who Jesus is, 
We ought to listen to what he says even more than what we would if an angel from heaven were to come and speak to us. Hebrews 2.1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, meaning the things that we have heard from Jesus, lest at any time we should let them slip or literally find ourselves drifting away. I was talking to someone recently about their spiritual life and they told me that they have a tendency to sort of slip or drift away. Many people are like that. If that's a tendency with you, you better stop it right there before it goes any farther. Uh, they say they want to live for God, but you can't live for God if you're slipping or if you're drifting away from God. And this is a common problem with people. Uh, but something we need to take some steps to stop like I said, before we drift too far or slip too far where we're unable to get back. The clincher for what he's saying comes from the simple logic there in verse 2. If what angels were sent to say always came to pass, and if people were punished for not obeying angels, then it's a far more serious thing to not listen to or neglect to what Christ, the Son of God, has had to say. <coughs> Verse 3 goes as far as saying, or asking, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. <clears throat> now understand that angels themselves were punished for not obeying. And this is one question I'm going to ask the Lord when I get to heaven. No plan of salvation was ever provided for angels. None. So I say to all of us today, we simply cannot afford to let ourselves drift or slip back into what God has saved us from or delivered us from. What would you ever say to the Lord in the way of defense of yourself? <clears throat> if He saved and delivered you from some sin, any sin, Lying, stealing, sexual sin, whatever. And then for whatever reason, you let yourself slip back into it. Good news is that God can keep us from slipping. Amen. He can keep us from drifting. <clears throat> as long as in our heart we don't want to slip back, and as long as in our heart we're willing to cooperate with God and to do the things we need to do to keep ourselves strong in the Lord and to give us victory. Many that slip back will tell you, oh, I want to go to heaven. But they like their sins too. You can't have both. That's right. Now please be clear, I think most of you here this evening are, we do not believe in eternal security around here, as some churches preach it. You can slip away. You can drift away. You can neglect this great salvation that God has for us. What would be the sense of warning us to not neglect it if we couldn't neglect it? 
And if you drift far enough away, you will find yourself way out there somewhere in left field where you no longer say, you no longer care, you're no longer on your way to heaven because you've drifted so far. The goal, you get in a little boat and it starts to drift and it just keeps drifting and drifting and drifting. You get to the point where you, if you're on a big body of water, you can't see the shore anymore. You can't see land anymore. Now I can think of at least five reasons this evening, and I'm sure there are more, <clears throat> But I want to think of five this evening for why a Christian can slip or drift away and neglect this great salvation that God has provided for us. And I, let's, so let's think of those five. First of all, we can drift or slip because salvation and heaven those are invisible things to us right now. They're concepts to us right now. Especially if you're young, these concepts seem so far away down the road. When you truly get saved from your sin by repenting of your sin, and believing on the finished work of Christ and the shed blood of Jesus, God in essence gives you a ticket to go to heaven. We all know that, we all believe that. Now that's a ticket that you may not have to use for 35, 45, 55 years. Maybe even longer depending on what age you got saved. But then, again, you may need it tomorrow. No one ever knows. But because life seems so long, the older you get, the shorter it seems like life is, though you, you learn. But because life seems so long, and when, it, when you're young, it seems like You've got so many years ahead of us and heaven is not a gift that you can hold in your hand and see. People tend to drift, to slip, to neglect this great salvation that God has provided for us. A new shotgun a new pair of jeans, a new car. Those are both things, gifts, you can hold in your hand or wear or drive. But heaven isn't something that you can see yet. So people have a tendency to not stay on their toes concerning it. Secondly, Another reason people slip or drift or neglect this salvation are the pressures and influences of people or the world around us. And people put the pressure on us. All of us. Don't they? You realize that as a minister, I even get pressure from other ministers you would think not, but I do. We all want to be accepted. We don't want to be different from the rest of the family. You don't want to be different from the other kids at school, the guys at work. There are probably people that could hang in there with God if the preacher followed them around all day. <coughs> or if they never left this building for any reason, or if everybody in their family, or if everybody that they worked with or went to school with were saved. But where in the world are you ever going to find that? 
everybody at a Christian school isn't even a Christian. So unless you're prepared to be an individual and stay with God, no matter what anybody else does or says, you never will stay with God. If you let the pressure get the best of you from wherever or whomever it comes from, you're probably going to find yourself slowly slipping or drifting away and neglecting this great salvation that God has provided for us. The third reason why people slip or drift or neglect this great salvation is that they fail to go on and get thoroughly and completely sanctified. The tendency of the carnal mind inside of you is to be unbelieving. The desires of the carnal nature are the things of the world. The lust of the flesh. The desire of the carnal nature is to sin. To think only of itself, yourself. To rebel against God. So unless you get sanctified, unless you get filled with God's Holy Spirit, unless you deal with the sin problem inside of you, and then stay sanctified, the reason and cause of your drifting and slipping will be right here inside of your own heart. You're the problem. The sin that is still in your heart is the problem. You become your own worst enemy. But then if you get honest with yourself, haven't you always been your own worst enemy all your life? I know I have. Most honest people say that they have been their own worst enemy. We need to have the carnal mind dealt with by the cleansing of the Holy Spirit if we intend to keep victory over sin in our life. Romans 8 7 through 8 gives us the reason why. Paul says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh, he says, cannot please God. Think of that. So if you still have something inside of you that is not subject to the law of God, <coughs> well, it wouldn't be a shocker to see you slip or to see you begin to drift if the enemy is still inside of you working. Fourthly, people can slip and drift even after they're sanctified, if they fail to discipline themselves to do the things that will help them and to keep them where they need to be. If you don't want to slip or drift away, you had better make up your mind that you're going to be at the house of God whenever the doors are open. Remember back in the days of the church when everybody thought that way. If they were really living for God, they thought they were going to be there every time the doors were open. It's not like that these days. Many times the doors aren't even open anymore. But many people can't even get in on Sunday morning. You're going to have to make up your mind if you don't want to slip that you're going to have to read that Bible daily. You're going to have to talk to the Lord. 
not just when you're in some mess. You're going to have to learn that you need to witness. Even tithe. Failure to do any of those are reasons I have actually heard people admit for why they slipped or drifted away from God. Listen, folks. It's 11 times harder to get something stopped than it is to get something started. Most of our problems, most people, their problems come from not really ever getting started. I hope you believe that. I know people that could never be stopped if they'd ever really get around to really getting started. Ponder that for a moment. It's 11 times harder to get something stopped than it is to get it started. If you don't believe that, just go out here in the woods somewhere and roll a big rock down the hill somewhere and try to stop it. See if you agree. It might take some work to get it to start rolling, but once it gets rolling, buddy, it's hard to get it stopped. If you don't believe that, listen to what has always, and I have always loved this illustration. It's been my favorite illustration over the years to, to use. You've probably heard me use it somewhere before to illustrate this truth. In 1803, the British government created a civil service job that called for a man to stand on the cliffs of Dover with a spyglass. His job was he was instructed to ring a bell if he saw Napoleon coming to invade England. Napoleon died in 1821. But the British government didn't abolish the job until 1945. 124 years after Napoleon died. Now think of that. Your job is to watch for somebody that has been dead for 124 years. <laughs> Why didn't they stop it until then? Well, I think first of all, that shows you how government works. But it also shows the truth, illustrates the truth, that it is 11 times harder to get something stopped than it is to get it started. Once you get it started, once you get it going, it's much harder to get it stopped than it was to get it started. If you don't believe that, just think about Obamacare that they rubbed down, uh, rammed down our throats, and uh, that you know they'd like to get rid of, but uh, they told us we have to pass it without reading it and all that stuff and still they can't seem to get rid of it. You know, when the government does something like that guy with the spyglass, good luck at turning back the clock. It never <coughs> happened. And some things we're stuck with. Because it's 11 times harder to get something stopped than it is to get something started. And I know people and you know people that nothing can ever stop them spiritually if they ever really got down to business and really got started. I don't mean just this little wimping around, just talking about God once in a while, or 
going to an altar with no chains or, or anything like that. But if they ever really got started, they'd never be able, nothing would be able to stop them if they'd stick to the things they know. John Wesley used to ask his early Methodists, once they got saved and got God working in their life, he would actually say to them, can you go a single minute without sinning? Well, of course people would say. They could hold their breath for a minute. So who couldn't go a single minute without sinning? Uh, if they said they could, Wesley would say, well then, why not two minutes? And if so, you can go two minutes? Well then, why not five minutes? He would say to them. Or an hour. Or a day. Or a week. You're still practicing sin. God can help you to stop and stay stopped. If you ever decide that you really want to stop. But there's the problem. Deciding that you really want to stop. A final reason why people slip or drift away. So forth is they just plain don't want to live for God bad enough. Just simple as that. No amount of anything else that you can name will help you to live for God and to live a victorious life over sin unless you make up your mind that you want to do it with all your heart. A half-hearted attempt will always result in half-hearted action. So, we need to ask ourselves, do we really want to live for God? Do we really want to live a life of victory over sin in our life? Make heaven our home someday? You don't want it bad enough. It won't happen. And somewhere along the road, you end up slipping or drifting away. We've had a few folks even in the church here recently that that's what's happened to them. They just slipped and drifted away. Folks, it is not just in today's world that this is true. But it is always taken a total commitment for life to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Those that don't want to slip or drift away must take up their cross daily and follow Him and not look back. Realizing that Jesus said in Luke 9.62 that no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Anyway, think of that. Put your hand to the plow and look back. Jesus said, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Lot's wife looked back. She had one chance. She looked back. She was saved. And she looked back. And look what happened to her. What we are seeing in our world ought to tell us that the rapture of the church must be very close. So we need to be very careful lest we slip at this late hour.
Wouldn't it be a travesty to walk with God for years and then for whatever reason to slip back, to drift away, to neglect this great salvation that was purchased for us on that cross. Oh, my friend, no matter what happens to you in your life, no matter what you get to thinking, no matter what gets to happening, don't ever allow yourself to slip away or to drift back. You'll wish you wouldn't have if you did. Let's stand. Oh, may God help whoever may be listening to this, even on YouTube, if you've drifted, you've been slipping away from the things of God. Stop it right now while you can put a halt to it. Well, you can do something about it before it gets too bad. Before you've passed that point where it's hard to get back. There is a point you can slip and drift where it becomes very hard to get back. A person needs to nip it in the bud whenever it happens and get back right away. Let's bow our heads and join together in a closing word of prayer. Waylon, would you please dismiss us?